So we're going to begin by having a look at what we can learn from the social lives of animals. And of course animals come in a bewildering variety of forms, don't they? And they have all kinds of absolutely unimaginable social lives. So where should we look? Well, I'm, I chose just to pick out two animals that played a particular role in how humans came to understand themselves and their social organisation. And these both gave the Victorians nightmares. Victorians had a lot to worry about. Among other things, uh, Queen Victoria was around towards the end of the 19th century and Charles Darwin had a, appeared on the scene and the theory of evolution had become uh, generally accepted in some form, although an awful lot was still to be understood. And these two animals, the chimpanzee and the ant, gave them particular cause for concern. So let's think about the ant first. We'll get to the chimpanzee in a minute. The end of the 19th century, we said science had started to be turned to areas that had previously been uh, unstudied. The scientific psychology was only just taking off, for example. Another area in which scientific methods were slowly and somewhat ineptly being applied was in the study of human social organization or society. You know, society is, 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 it's not clear what kind of a thing or if one should make society a thing, how to study this, and so, as usual, a lot of different attempts were made. But the context is, of course, the end of the 19th century. The Industrial Revolution has changed human living immeasurably, particularly in Europe, particularly in the UK and in America. People have flocked to the cities, they're now working in factories, their lives have been upended, and their a form of social order is coming into being with its own kind of rules and regularities. And uh, people are very unsure what to make of this. Um, and there was a particular passion at this time for studying ants. Um, the reason ants were so interesting is because when you look at an ant colony, you see something in which everyone works for the good of the colony. Um, and they work with differentiated social roles. So you've got the queen, you've got workers, you've got soldiers. You've got nurses, you've got, you've got a whole variety of social roles and each individual seems to only really exist for the colony. Ants don't seem to have much in the way of a personal life. Their whole activity from being born to dying seems to be dictated by this social role that they have. Now ants are not alone in this, it's fairly common in insect societies. Um, to have this form of organization. It's called eusocial organization. And in the eusocial organization of an ant colony or a beehive, you're born and you get assigned a social role and that's going to be your role for your life. There's basically no social mobility like there we'll, we'll see with primates. No question of improving your lot in life and so on. So the what this elicited in the Victorians, and the reason it disquieted them, is because it seemed to suggest that what you do, your chances in life, your opportunities, whether you'll do well or poorly in life, seems to be imposed by your position within society. So they were worried about what we might call social determinism. The, the fact that you can identify a social role might lead you to question whether you are making the role or the role is making you, as it were. Um, now, of course, we're not ants, uh, we're very far from ants, but this was the time at which the formations of society first became something that you could observe in humans, and that's why it was so disquieting, because they weren't, they hadn't uh, thought for very long about this, end of the 19th century, studying ants, looking at human society, this was a whole new area of, of uh, inquiry. It was going to give rise to the social sciences to so human uh, sociology, for example, and social sciences. But um, the question underlying this is whether the uh, your engagement in a particular kind of social order completely dictates who you are. Now, interestingly, what the Victorians didn't know is that this is not unique to insects. There's even one mammal who engages in this kind of eusocial organization, showing that the 
form of social organization is kind of independent of the body morphology of the of the animal in question. If you find you social organization in insects, maybe it's an insect thing. If you find you social organization in insects and a mammal, then it's kind of independent of the animal's substructure. So here's just a little video about the naked mole rat, which is the mammal which exhibits eusocial organization. The naked mole rat. Although it's neither a mole nor a rat. Much about their behavior is strange. They spend their entire lives in virtually complete darkness, weaving their way through an underground network of burrows and tunnels. Within their dark universe, they've evolved a rigid society that has more in common with ants or bees than with a typical mammalian social circle. At the top is a long, strong queen. She is the mother of all the other mole rats in the colony, which may total a few dozen or a few hundred. As long as she lives, she and a few chosen boy toys are the only ones that breed. The queen keeps the rest from mating by sheer intimidation. Their lives are all work and no foreplay. Some mole rats are drafted as soldiers to protect the colony from rival mole rats and predators. A quick sniff determines insider from outsider. Other mole rats tend to the young, clean burrows, dig tunnels, and look for food. Their giant incisors actually are outside their mouths, so the mole rats can shovel away without eating dirt. They dig in teams. The lead digger carves out the tunnel. Others pass the dirt back up the tunnel and out onto the surface. Going backwards or forwards is all the same. Though nearly blind, special hairs on their body help guide them and tell them where they're going. And even when traveling in the tunnels, each one's status in the hierarchy is clearly visible. The more senior members of the colony take the high road while the juniors wriggle through underneath. The tunnels are only a few inches wide, but a full-fledged colony can stretch for half a mile. All this work is done to find their principal food tubers scattered across the savanna. One of these giant roots can feed a colony for two to three weeks. And though they are born into a strict hierarchy, when it comes to food, everyone is equal. So much for the ants and the worries that they gave the Victorians, but there was nothing compared to what Darwin had wrought. Now, Darwin had demonstrated and argued for the mutability of species. Species includes, of course, human. And mutability means common ancestry. So this meant that humans were now no longer seen as a distinguished race or kind placed on earth by God, but were continuous with other living beings. And this was a shock to the system. This caricature here of Charles Darwin appeared as the debate over his principal works, The Origin of Species and the Descent of Man, raged and raged. Uh, people were profoundly 
horrified at what Darwin was telling them. Now, this was news to the Victorians, and it's not news to us, so we're less unsettled by this, but we can leave them their concerns and note what we've learned in the meantime. The first thing that is perhaps important to note here is that the line of descent, evolutionary descent, can only be a part of a much larger story. This was not clear to the Victorians, um, but we'll, we'll unpack that now. There's a little bit from the Tree of Life, so you can see there our common ancestry with the other great apes, bonobos and chimpanzees, together, our equal first cousins, as it were, and it's about six million years ago since the last common ancestor of those three great apes. And then go back a bit further in time and you'll find the last common ancestor that will also give rise to the gorilla lineage. And further back still, about 15 million years ago, the last common ancestor of all the great apes, including the orangutans. So we are equally distant from the chimpanzees and the bonobos. As we'll see, these two great apes have profoundly different social lives. But the Victorians knew nothing of this. The Victorian fear in this instance was one not of social determinism, but of biological determinism. They were worried that being so closely related to chimpanzees, and they only knew of chimpanzees, meant that you had to, be, you were de destined, doomed to be to exhibit a social life like the chimpanzee. And we have a somewhat larger picture than that. The first thing to note is that the great apes. Uh, belong in a much larger grouping of the primates, and the primates also includes the monkeys. Apes are not monkeys. Um, so we've got the five great apes, the chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, orangutans, and humans. Um, and then there's the monkeys, and then there's a variety of other primates. And there's something that primates do have in common, which is that they spend their entire lives sort of bettering themselves. If you're going to university, for example, you're exhibiting primate behavior by doing something that might improve your lot in life, might help you to get along. Ants don't go to university. They don't hold out the hope of moving up or being promoted. But primates, even those without universities, spend their whole lives um, defending and improving their situation in a highly complex social order. So that's primates in general. But it wasn't primates in general, you see, that so scared the Victorians. It was chimpanzees. And chimpanzees can be ferocious. Now, there's many images of chimpanzees that you might have, including comic characters on TV sitcoms and so on, but the wild chimpanzee is a fierce animal. They are also um, enormously social. They have culture, tools. Um, there's an awful lot to uh, love about chimpanzees, but they are not cute little animals at all. This picture is particularly frightening, but it's there to show you what the Victorians were afraid of. But the Victorians didn't know about the bonobos. So now we have two great apes to whom we are equally closely related. And they're worth aligning. They have a lot in common. They both live in open subgroups. Um, they both groom each other all the time, they both use tools, and they both hunt collectively, um, and they exhibit what we now recognize as various forms of culture. But there's a big difference between them. Chimpanzees, by and large, settle their differences with fists. They fight. They get aggressive, um, and they fight very, very bloodily, and they can be really, really scary. Um, they don't only fight, they have other ways of resolving disputes, but there's no denying the fact that chimpanzee life can be very, very violent. But the bonobo, to whom we are equally closely related, has a different social organization. These, the bonobos are, um, in, within the bonobo social order, it's the females and not the males that are dominant. So it's a matriarchy and not a patriarchy. <clears throat> and when conflict arises, they settle it through sex not through violence. So bonobos have sex in all kinds of ways. They have sex with children, they have sex with toys, they have homosexual sex, they have group sex. When they meet a, uh, another bonobo group, the two groups will advance cautiously, testing each other out, and after they've had, after some 
chosen representatives have had sex, they can get on and um, meet each other. So bonobos present a very, very different view of social organization, not one that would have made the Victorians happy, of course. The Victorians also had a thing about sex, so I'm not convinced that we can really allay their fears here. But what we can see is that their fear of biological determinism, that you're condemned to a chimpanzee-like social order because you're related to the chimpanzee, that this is false. So I'll spare your blushes, but I'm going to put a link also to a little five-minute video from National Geographic, which can show you something about the bonobos if you've never heard of them. One last point on primates is <clears throat> that this business of dealing with disputes is not simply a question of fighting or having sex. Um, primates have a variety of means for resolving their dispute, which is necessary because of the mobility of the primate social order, because everyone's always jostling for position, trying to improve their lot, checking that they're in with the alpha, um, means that conflict always arises in low, at a low level, and we now have evidence of, for, for what you might call reconciliation methods, ways of getting over your grievances in more than 20, 50, 25 different primate species. Now, that seems to be essential to the primate social order. That is something we can learn. We also need to learn how to get over our differences, how to move on from the past, how to solve disputes um, as primates. Uh, we, 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 tr we try various means, including sex and fighting. Um, chimpanzees actually will use sometimes mediators, that is, an elder chimpanzee will be brought in to legislate a dispute among younger chimpanzees. And this combination of ways of getting over your disputes, um, together with the vigorous dynamic of primate social life, leads to what we might call culture. Now, we these are big words, society, culture. Um, but as we look more and more at the animal world, the more we realize how limited our human understanding of these terms is and the more we have to learn. One thing that we have learned since the Victorians, and that possibly we need to relearn again and again, is that evolutionary descent is only one part of the story. Now we saw with the ants, there's a eusocial organization common to many insects, but also found in mammals, so that the social order is by and large independent of the bodily substrate. Well, social orders have this, that they're not simply given by the kind of body you have. In the last uh, suite of videos, we noted that neuroscience has found in a cell type that is common to the great apes, but not the monkeys, but that has arisen independently in whales and dolphins and in elephants. And although we don't have a firm interpretation of this, this seems very likely to be linked to the particular kind of social organization that these widely separated animals have in common. They, their social organizations all involve a great deal of cooperation, a great deal of collective activity, collective caring for family and young, and um, a great deal of empathy. Um, so evolutionary descent should not be seen as determining the form of social organization, social life that you're going to participate in. So those Victorians, they slept badly. They had biological determinism to worry about, which today we might call genetic determinism. They were worried about social determinism. It's not that we have simpler lives, <laughs> um, but their fears, their initial fears of simple determinism here were unfounded. But there's no denying it that we have significant challenges as we address our own form of sociality and seek still to take on the lessons that Darwin has insisted that we need to learn, which is what kind of animal are we?